So we're going to move on now to our roundtable. And so um, just a friendly reminder, my name is Myra Serrano. I'm the Senior Manager of CCARE, the Community Outreach and Engagement Center at City of Hope. So today's roundtable is really going to focus on this impact of COVID-19 in our communities and also in the work that we do and the services that we provide. So as many of the speakers noted in their uh, presentations, COVID-19 pandemic really highlighted many health inequities in our communities. Communities of color were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, and we saw some of the highest death rates uh, from COVID in Latino, African-American, and Native American communities. And as Natalie Burke uh, really brought up, these disparities were a direct result of systemic inequities. So we know that our communities of color are more likely to work in essential jobs leading to higher exposure. They uh, had lack of access to care or even access uh, to sick leave to take time off when they were sick. There's things like language barriers. And I know we also brought up with Dr. LaCava the idea of the digital divide among others. So many of us really did have to pivot, um, you know, going back to Dr. LaCava's favorite word, right, pivot to address these new needs of our community due to COVID. I know, you know, we normally, being in a cancer center, our focus is cancer and other chronic diseases, but, you know, when it, there's a pandemic, it really brought in a different situation. Uh, and so we really had to work uh, with our community partners to address these new needs and things like overcoming the digital divide. So I know one of the things that we did in um, the cancer support community, as Dr. LaCava mentioned, did something similar. You know, we created like this loan library where we had, um, you know, notebooks and uh, hotspots and Wi-Fi hotspots that we could be able to loan out for people who did not have access to this technology. I became somewhat of a mini Zoom expert, uh, never had really known how to use Zoom before until the pandemic. And then I had to actually uh, train our community partners on how to use it so that they can continue engaging the members of their organization. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, introduce our round table now and jump a little bit into that topic. So first off, we have Kim Hammer. She's an author and business owner, a professional speaker, a blogger who lives in Los Angeles. In 2009, she watched her 44-year-old husband take his last breath. Their children were 12, 9, and 7 at the time. While her husband had cancer and after he died, they were amazed and humbled by the creative and thoughtful ways their friends, family, and coworkers supported them. Kim started calling these kind of actions acts of love. Wanting to show others how simple and impactful acts of love are, Kim wrote 100 Acts of Love, a girlfriend's guide to loving your friend through cancer or loss, and launched at the 100actsoflove.com. Kim currently guides HR leaders and managers in building specific strategies to support employees affected by cancer. Next up, we have Sophia Sharp Donaldson, who leads the Global Strategic Sourcing and Procurement um, organization for Kite Pharma, a Gilead company. With responsibilities for indirect and direct categories of spend and source to settle processes globally. She also is chair of Kite's Global Raw Material Council, co-chair of Technical Operations Women's Leader Network, ERG advisor to Kite Global and Globe and Women at Gilead Southern Chapter, and Kite ambassador to the Cancer Support Community LA Equity and Diversity Committee. Her distinguished 25 years experience includes holding executive and senior leadership roles at Fortune 500 biotech companies, transforming the bottom line objectives in roles in finance, procurement, operations, order to cash, and supply chain, planning, distribution, and logistics. Her focus continues to be all things directly or indirectly, saving or extending the lives of our patients. Next, we have Anna Rocha is an advanced oncology certified nurse practitioner at Providence. She is head of the Survivorship Thrivership Prevention Care Program at St. John's Health Center. What fuels Anna is her passion for providing quality and equitable care for all people with cancer and their loved ones. She has been a nurse practitioner for nearly five years and a registered nurse for more than 16 years with experience in caring for hospital inpatients, administering therapy as an infusion center nurse, and running an outpatient oncology clinic. She has taken initiatives to create pilot programs such as mental health collaborative care model in the ecology population, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program, advanced care planning EMR initiatives, 
and first ever Survivor's Day celebration. Next, we also have Julia Applegate, who directs the Equitas Health Institute, where she leads LGBTQ plus health education research and community engagement efforts to improve the health and, commu uh, and community engagement efforts, sorry, to improve the health and wellness of the LGBT communities across Ohio and beyond. Julia is experienced in curriculum design, education and public health program policy development. She has worked in public health programs focused on women's health, HIV, AIDS, and LGBTQ plus health. With over 20 years of academic teaching experience, Ms. Applegate is a skilled trainer and experienced presenter who has designed curricula, conducted train the trainer program, and presented at local and international conferences on public health, HIV, AIDS, gender, and sexual orientation topics. Just ignore my dogs fighting in the background. Um, next, we have Zul Zarani, who's the Director of Community Outreach and Engagement at Cedar sinai a highly collaborative, engaging, and capacity-building expert with 20 years demonstrated success in developing and leading community outreach and engagement for health systems, cancer centers, and universities. Zul has extensive leadership experience in building and documenting research-driven outreach infrastructure that means NCI designation guidelines. He has demonstrated excellence in providing strategic leadership in community-based outreach, research with populations, experiencing disparities and managing NIH-funded research grants and centers. And I've had the privilege of working with Zul for many years. So please welcome our uh, roundtable participants, and we're also going to re-invite Dr. Kimlin Ashin and Dr. Lakava to join our roundtable as well. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to take just a quick second to calm my dog <laughs> so everybody can hear me. I'll step in while we're waiting for Myra to come back just to say hello and how thrilled I am to be on this roundtable with all of you. We, as an organization, have worked with all of you and it's just very exciting. So thank you for being here today. And some of you I haven't seen in a while, or especially in person, but it's so wonderful to see each of you. So thank you for being a part of today. Thank you so much. It's, it's the trouble of having a puppy and a senior dog that don't get along very well. <laughs> but thank you for your patience. So I'm gonna get started by asking the group a question. How has COVID really impacted your operations where you are currently working? Anybody can feel free to jump in. So I can go ahead and start. Um, I'm Anna Rocha and thank you very much for having uh, me be part of this round table. Um, it has, COVID-19 has, uh, there are no words. I've never, you know, not ever having been through a pandemic. Um, as a nurse, I always knew that, you know, there's always that potential for, um, you know, uh, being infected, uh, right? Um, a needle stick or anything like that, uh, tuberculosis and things like that. But COVID-19 just put an extra layer of something that um, cannot really be described but because it was so unknown. Um, could we bring it home to our family? Our patients were scared, you know, to even come in for treatment um, and also infecting their own families. So it was just a level of fear of the unknown and uh, that was just uh, rampant. So uh, that's, that's one of the ways, just an added level of fear and stress in a time when there's a cancer diagnosis that just magnified it. Yes, thank you so much. Exactly. I, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. And just the whole idea of fear surrounding this, right? I, I know definitely I put off my mammogram uh, because of that fear and then had, had another fear a few months later when I found a lump and worry that why didn't I go sooner? And luckily, um, you know, for me, it was a fatty mass. Never been so happy to hear the word fat in my life. Uh, but, you know, uh, luckily it worked out well in my case, but yes, thank you for adding that. Anybody else would like to share how COVID has impacted your uh, operations and your organization? You know, I think on top of the fear, there was just this amazing amount of loneliness. 
um, because people were having to go to get treatment without their support with them. They weren't allowed, they couldn't bring in anybody with them. And so it really increased the level of isolation that already happens when you have a cancer diagnosis. Um, so for me, what I saw was that level and then also the level of depression um, of just sort of that, you know, that, that feeling like this is only happening to me, this is my life, this isn't going very well, this is really, really hard. So that seemed to also um, really increase over, over and, and still around. It's so interesting, even though some of the people I know are allowed to go in and visit, it's still that, that, that hesitancy and that sense of isolation is still really strong within the people that I, I work with. I guess I'll go next. Um, we have gone completely um, virtual in our community engagement, which was, you know, a, a new thing for me because most of our work really touches our um, community partners, our community advocates. Um, we were always going to where they were, always going to where the community is. Um, but actually, um, you know, in the midst of this crisis, which is, of course, horrific and still very much with us, unfortunately, um, we found that we could actually do things together differently. Um, and and in, in many ways, um, because I work mostly with, with advocates, and so it's not direct, you know, patient service, I think that worked well for advocates because then we could actually engage more advocates who had challenges in terms of barriers to transportation, to participating in events. Um, you know, we actually could have, you know, phone numbers now and, and have in, in a weird way, a more personal reach because now I, I, I felt, and I felt comfortable having to give people my, my phone number because that way we can, you know, um, connect more readily. Um, so for many of my community partners it's actually increased and intensified the relationship and even the activities because um, with Breast Cancer Awareness Month just, you know, happening, it, it was, you know, lots of presentation, it was Zoom, um, but lots of presentation, um, lots of evening presentations. And so um, we actually found out in some ways we could do more <laughs> because it, it took out the transportation component to it and we could reach um, a wider net, um, including um, reaching a, 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 a LA community, but beyond, right? Because you know, it's Zoom, so anyone can join. So in, in some ways, it um, amplified our reach, um, but we know, um, and, and that has been discussed before, the digital divide. And so um, actions had to be taken with certain communities to get those communities um, online and available to use those resources so they could also benefit. Um, and so, you know, for those who were more comfortable it, it, with, you know, technology, it actually was a huge benefit to both us and to them because we could engage more advocates. Yeah, that's definitely true. It was a lot easier for, for the organizations that had worked in this virtual arena before. And I know one of the things, um, you know, some of the silver linings for us uh, you know, we were able to um, rebudget some of that money that was going towards mileage and food. We were able to provide services in language. So Zoom has um, interpretation channels. So for the first time ever, we were able to offer our virtual classes in multiple languages, whether it was Chinese and Spanish simultaneously, as opposed to us taking the time to do it in English, stop doing it in Spanish and making it longer you know, that was something that, you know, we weren't able to do before that we were able to do now in this virtual arena. In addition, you know, some of that rebudgeting, we were able to buy those Chromebooks and those Wi-Fi hotspots um, to be able to overcome the digital divide. So definitely, you know, some things did work while others didn't, but for us uh, being able to offer those services in, in language was really useful. Anybody else would like to add about? Yeah. Myra, uh, so what I wanted to just add, I, I agree with both you and Kimlin. Um, we really had to change the way 
we do outreach and you know the bulk of our work is in brokering information and knowledge to communities uh, that don't have this information and you know to enable uh, in language brokering and providing information that's you know uh, appropriate in terms of literacy. Uh, and so one of the things, one of the challenges we did encounter was that because we work in partnership with community organizations that are trusted within these populations, many of our communities we work with are immigrants, uh, they didn't have the capacity to keep their communities together. We work with a lot of churches and they didn't have the technology to keep their congregations together. And just like you said, we rebudgeted a lot of our funding to buy cameras and to, you know, set up Zoom accounts and do capacity building and training and really, you know, enabling them to reach their congregations to set up like texting software and whatever that was necessary to to you know, prompt people and get resources out to them. And, and that enabled us to you know, get vital information. And you know, initially we realized that a lot of the information that was coming out of the CDC and other national organizations was all in English. There was really no information for different communities. And so again, we had to broker that very quickly um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, we pivoting really helped us get to our communities uh, quickly and with uh, life saving information. Thank you for sharing that, Zul. Anybody else would like to share? I'll add just a little bit. Um, I'm joining you all from Ohio, and where I'm located, we have a contract with our state health department to do education with mammography providers um, across our state, many of whom are in rural environments. And the shift to, um, you know, tele-education, you know, Zoom education was rapid, of course, like all of us, we had to do this rapidly. Um, and we had always really favored in-person training because of the connections that you can make. And um, But we found that we were actually able to reach more people um, particularly in the rural communities and even in a larger city sometimes because trying the administrative burden of trying to do a cold call to the Cleveland Clinic to reach mammography providers is next to impossible. But when you put out a flyer electronically through a network of oncology nurses and they share it with all their friends, then suddenly we've got people from all over our state and beyond um, listening to our, our lectures and learning from what we do. So for us, we ended up touching more um, locations as not, I don't know if it was necessarily more people, but more spaces got our education, which is, is certainly better for us. All right, we're always looking for that broader reach. And so the virtual uh, world allowed us some of that. Yeah, anybody else want to share? Hi, this is Sophia. And uh, first of all, I'm honored to be here with all of you. I'm representing sort of a, um, the manufacturer uh, of, of these important um, life-saving medicines. And so, you know, what we are focused on is CAR-T. And so during COVID, our patients have usually are at the point where they have little hope. They've gone through chemotherapy and all the various treatments. And um, finding flights to do their apheresis and getting um, their, their cells to us to remanufacture or re-engineer in 16 to 21 days and get those back to them to give their loved ones and themselves hope um, was a little bit of a challenge in the height of COVID. There were not many flights. There were a lot of cancellations. And so, you know, looking at just how to keep the hope alive for these patients and their families and making sure that we could get their products back or their drug back to them and, and hopefully save their life. Um, we found creative ways to work with airlines and work with um, uh, provider, telecare providers and all the rescheduling and the lack of rooms, um, um, space for patients and treatments and, and moving those around. I think we got closer um, um, in the relationships to make sure that we were you know, keeping the patient in the forefront. So. It was challenging, but like many of you, I think all of us became very creative and some of those learnings and how we approached our operations have now changed forever. And, and, and for some cases for good, I think. 
Thank you so much, Sophia, for that comment. And actually it leads into one of the other questions that, you know, what, what changes were made during COVID that you think will be continue to be implemented when we return back to our new normal, um, you know, after COVID, if there is after COVID? I can speak a little to the, the, the question from a community uh, health and, and community organization standpoint. First off, just recognizing the privilege that we had that we were all able to stay working and work from home. We, we were able to eliminate the exposures to COVID and our, all of our staff were able to make that transition. So we didn't have layoffs. So I think we were very fortunate for that. Um, but it was a learning curve to kind of navigate this new virtual space with all of our members. Um, in terms of going back, yes, we know we want to, uh, and, and there's a, a lot of, of members and staff that are ready to be face-to-face -face again, but to that point, uh, and I think Sophia touched on it a little bit of like those little areas that we gained something from, uh, we're going to have a brand new platform. We originally considered ourselves as having five core components of care. I think, I think we have a sixth. It really is this ability to offer telemental health. Um, individuals that responded in some of our surveys through 2020 and, and in 2021 for just program evaluations, finding people that it wasn't COVID that was the obstacle. They had not been connected with us because of, you know, treatment side effects that they couldn't leave their home, geography, and all of these elements, even in some of our targeted services, we have um, a gay men's prostate group which is kind of one of a kind. So we, we have anyone from California able to access our emotional support and our individual counseling, but we'll connect them with their local affiliate, but somebody from San Francisco can join that group because they're not, they're, there might not be one in that area. And we can collaborate through our different organizations to see, okay, so we might have this, but what do you have that's targeted that we can share with our members? So it, I think there's just a, a lot of benefits in an odd way coming from something so kind of traumatic and tragic. Uh, so we want to really lean in, into to that and, and grow from that. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful point. I know for us, uh, we're also gonna stay with this hybrid model of offering in-person and virtual for our classes. We have a nutrition program that's uh, over 12 weeks. That's actually a research study. And we were so worried we were going to not have engaged participants, you know, because there's something to be said about in person building that social support, that intimate environment. It actually turned out that we had higher engagement and more people completed more classes in the virtual version of the program. So we were really happy to see that. And so that's going to, you know, really change the way we offer that program now, whether, you know, maybe have an in-person or virtual one at the same time or one of each. So I know that's definitely true for us. Does anybody else want to add what has changed and that's going to stay the same after COVID? Um, Myra, I wanted to point out that uh, within our organization and organizations that we work with, uh, closely in the community, um, you know, putting a spotlight on communities with inequities has really changed the way uh, large institutions are thinking now. And I think this is an amazing thing. We've been working towards this for decades and, you know, it's finally happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're seeing, for example, a lot more resources being poured into language access. Um, and, you know, disaggregating data. So, you know, and we're in our health system, in our research, we are looking at, you know, how do we be more inclusive? And, you know, a lot of this thinking came out of community outreach and engagement. And now, you know, it is being implemented uh, system-wide and we're just so thrilled. We have a long ways to go because, you know, it's one thing to just change variables. And it's another thing to look at, you know, the whole person and all of their needs. So I think we're working towards that kind of advocacy. That I just want so to true. add, Myra, to oh, go ahead, what, Dr. What, Zul just, what Zul just said. You know, I, I think the culmination of COVID and our racial reckoning and, and, and awareness, and, you know, we just had to come to terms with the fact that our society, we, we couldn't pretend anymore that, you know, things are okay, that, that there's a vulnerability in terms of health, 
and that they're vulnerable communities because they don't have access to, to good health. And we, we have not previously prioritized. And, and so I, I think all of our organizations are now really um, focusing, financing, prioritizing um, uh, health equity and, and broadening the definition of diversity. So ethnic, linguistic, um, sexual and gender minority. I, I think we are now aligning with our humanity. And so in this, you know, horrible set of events, I, I think we're looking inwards um, individually and also societally and, um, and institutionally. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, that we, we are doing better and that we would see um, true evidence of community health improvement on, on many fronts. Would anybody else like to add to that conversation? Because I, I would definitely agree, right? That um, it, it made, it, it put the focus on both the racial inequities and in COVID and, you know, it kind of was, you know, all of this built up and just exploded during the, the last couple of years. Um, and one of the things that I think a lot of organizations tried to do was provide more of this training. And the fact that we were virtual was easy to do a lunchtime Zoom training on DEI or on COVID. Um, I know that's something we've been much more involved. I don't think we've ever done so much internal capacity building in COE. Um, we were always so focused externally in our community partners, but now we're doing a lot more internally because uh, we were able to turn that around and say, okay, how are, is our staff um, able to engage with communities and what kind of training can we offer so that they're better able to work with communities and address all these community needs? Um, and so I think that's also for us something that's going to stay the same um, is doing a lot more of that work in turn. Of course, it's adding to our load of work, right? But it's all towards the same benefit. Uh, we're all doing this so that we're able to meet community needs. So uh, I don't know if uh, anybody feels the same way and uh, you feel that you've done a lot more internally as well. Yes, I um, actually participated in a group, a community-based group called Familias um, Latinas Unidas, and was able to provide, because early on, you know, I'm struggling to gather all the data and process all the information from COVID and what it is and how it's working and what the effects are. And there was so much misinformation that, um, you know, they, they asked me to come and, and and do a talk, which I did, it was virtual, um, but you know, how COVID affects kids, what symptoms to watch for and things like that. And then they invited me again later and it was all in Spanish in their language and um, they felt very comfortable. And there's this um, misconception that because they don't ask questions, I say they, but you know, the Latinx community don't ask questions doesn't mean that they're not interested or they don't want to know, you know, it's a level of comfort. And when you have someone uh, who looks like them, um, they're speaking in their language, it makes all the difference. So. Definitely representation matters, right? Yes. Anybody else would like to join in that topic? We'll move on to our next question then. How have other underserved communities benefited from this new emphasis on prioritizing services with a human emphasis, such as the LGBTQ plus community? Stop. I, I think um, it, it's been um, an opportunity for me to to learn and grow um, in terms of um, my integration of, you know, the communities that I serve and the communities that I prioritize. And um, I'll have to say, you know, having, and this may be an old term now, but having woke children, um, it, it's put me in a space where 
I have to expand my, uh, my integration of diversity. So I started off, of course, focusing on, on ethnic and socioeconomic, and certainly my you know, presentation did focus on that because I've done less in the space in terms of sexual and gender a minority and diverse population, but it's certainly, I think, part of this reckoning and inward looking um, in, in terms of our humanity, it, it really has expanded certainly my work. And, um, and so part of the um, California Dialogue on Cancer, the cancer control um, uh, plan and, and work that we're doing and Zool's involved in that as well, um, we have formed a health equity um, work group. And this year we have prioritized the LGBTQ plus community um, for you know, attention and service. And we are you know, soon to you know, launch a plan where we are working with um, cancer centers, because of course this is you know, cancer focused, but we hope that it would spread to other um, health issues as well, but how are we um, collecting and serving our diverse community and are we even asking um, questions that have to do with sexual and gender minorities? So do we know who our patients are and, and integrating that data with societal determinants of health as well, because we need to capture, you know, that whole person. So um, I just wanted to share that and, and just very, very excited about the work that we're doing. And we hope that it will certainly affect how, um, you know, cancer centers, you know, serve their community and, and better serve all um, persons um, with cultural competency, humility, and compassion. Um, I'd love to add to what Kimlin just said. And, you know, again, uh, this this starts with, you know, you talked about structural racism earlier and, you know, the fact that a lot of vulnerable populations are invisibilized because there is no data on them, right? And uh, SGM populations is one population that you didn't see the disparities. And I think as leaders uh, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, as leaders in, in this area of addressing inequities, we all have to take a position. And I think that uh, what Kimlin did, what the state did is to really take a position on this issue and you know, being very inclusive of seeing how can we collect better data on this population. Um, we've been doing this at Cedar sinai and you know, we're even impacting our research enterprise to start collecting it and hopefully, it'll all trickle up to the state where we'll be able to have cancer profiles for a lot of these communities that are left out. But I think it starts with all of us taking a position and making sure that you know, these populations are not invisible anymore. So data disaggregation is the way to go. I'll, I'll add too, like in our community, I feel like there's certainly there's more of a recognition of disparities in general. And that helps all populations that are experiencing disparities, not always you know, the same way, um, but I, I think what I've seen in Ohio is our version of, of our, our, our um, chapter of the cancer support community and other cancer like hospitals that are, are focusing on cancer are, they're hiring more people who can work with this population. And, they're often hiring people who are from the population. And it's those two things together um, that really start to make the impact because we, you know, we know from research that individuals are often seeking providers who are like them and they feel safer and they're more likely to come back and stay in medical care and adhere to medical regimens when they're working with people who are like them. And it's been slow, but, it's certainly in the last six or eight years changed faster than I would have ever expected it to. Um, and so I know I, I see there being so much more space for people, for patients and support folks and caregivers to be able to be who they are when they engage with a medical provider in ways that um, I don't think have been available to so many people for so long. And it may seem like a, a minor thing. Um, 
to have to perhaps hide your identity or not bring your wife to your partner or your appointment. Um, but it's so critical to creating um, healthy relationships with providers and better outcomes that I, I just think that it's, it's such an important change. Thank you so much, Julia. And I know one of the other communities that I think uh, another underserved community that we could focus more on that human emphasis as the question asked is the undocumented community, right? Uh, in California, we're used to offering services um, for undocumented, but I think many of the states that had to offer free vaccines, uh, you know, was one of the first times, you know, federal services were provided for undocumented persons so that we can make sure that everybody had access, not just to testing, but to vaccines. Um, and so that I know that was a big push to make sure that people understood you don't need an ID, you don't need, um, you know, insurance, right? So also the uninsured community so that we could get everybody vaccinated. And hopefully, you know, um, you know, in California, we're ahead of the curve, of course, you know, starting to offer, you know, coverage, medical coverage to our undocumented population 55 and older. But, you know, the rest of the country, maybe not so much. And so hopefully this is the start of that, being able to provide services where people don't have to be afraid uh, of, you know, going to get these services for fear of deportation or for fear of repercussions. I mean, we're already seeing that ICE isn't going to raid workplaces. Um, and so, you know, that's a huge, um, it makes a huge difference, you know, because people are just trying to make a living. So I think that's another community where hopefully, um, you know, from this COVID experience, we're able to provide more of these services and focusing on the person uh, and not so much on those documents, right? So if anybody else wants to add to that question, if not, I'll move on to our next question. Any burning comments? So my next question is for Kim. When you were going through the death of your husband, were you able to find the support you needed via institution? You mentioned family and friends being your primary support, but just wondering if there was anything that an institution was able to provide for you. Kim, you're muted. The answer to that is no. Um, what I found was that there wasn't a lot of support for caregivers. Um, and I definitely want, I want to take a moment to talk about the difference between caretakers and caregivers. Caretakers take care of things. Caregivers take care of people. Um, and so I just wanted, because I know sometimes those two words get interchanged. Um, so um, it what I really did rely on family and friends, and most of them didn't really understand what, you know, what I was going through. Um, my husband had plenty of opportunity to find support, um, which at some point he chose to do, and then at one point he chose not to do. But um, when I inquired at several different places about it, um, they said, you know, yeah, we have this one group that happens, you know, once a week. And, you know, we were being treated, we were in, uh, we were living in Venice, we were being treated at Cedar sinai um, So for me to take the extra drive, which was an hour and a half round trip to get up to Cedar sinai for myself, being the primary caregiver for my husband wasn't going to happen. Um, and I do know that um, through, a lot of, through, through COVID, a lot of caregivers have been able to get the support that they needed. And I think that that, that is, like everyone's talked about, that's been the blessing. Um, if my husband had been sick during COVID, I would have definitely been able to get more support uh, because I wouldn't have had to go anywhere and hadn't to get into a car. Yes, but that's one of the reasons I do, one of the reasons I talk about what I talk about is to help the caregivers, help people help the caregivers and support the caregivers who are the primary support for the person who's dealing with cancer. Yeah, that's a wonderful point, Kim, thank you. Any of you here who are representing organizations and what is it that we can do to provide more services for caregivers, like Kim mentioned? I might jump in and it might sound like a plug, but to back to the idea of collaboration, because I think there are so many health systems in play that there is the primary focus on the patient, that having that secondary service for caregivers is a little bit harder to do with regard to staffing, you know, budgeting. And that is where I think that it is a, a wonderful place to partner and be able to come up with easier referrals or be able to invite a group into your space that can, you know, 
offer a service that you might not have. So I think partnership would be a great way, but that's coming from the lens of the community health side. Um, but that's how we, we have been really growing in, in, in terms of our services is by partnering with hospitals and getting those services into the to hospitals remotely and, and virtually. We're currently piloting, uh, we have a large population of people with brain tumors, and we're currently piloting a support group for patients and caregivers where they can both be on screen and both, you know, there's a small presentation um, for education, and then the rest of the time is really allowed for people to kind of express their feelings and what they're going through and the challenges, right, um, as a patient and the, sometimes the frustration that um, the caregiver is, you know, focusing maybe on diet, but it's not pleasurable for the patient to focus just on those types of things. And so we have noticed, um, you know, it's it's been known, but if you don't take care of the caregiver, then the patient's, you know, um, quality of life will also, and, um, you know, compete, completing therapy and, and continuing therapy will also not be well. So we really make an extra effort to make sure that that caregiver is, is doing okay. Are they sleeping at night? Are they eating? How are they managing the kids? How are they balancing work life? And all of these things, um, we talk with them and let them know that we're here, not just for the patient, but also for them as well and for their children. So being able to have a social worker reach out to them at different time points, see how they're doing, how they're managing, what needs they might have. It might be as simple as having someone come out to do cleaning once a week, um, you know, and that's a huge relief and a huge stress off of, um, off their minds. So, yeah. Thank you. Anna, Anna. let's talk. <laughs> Anybody want to add to that? conversation? Well, I, I did want to just throw in a little bit that, you know, I'm working with two corporate clients right now who, um, one of them, the employee is the person with cancer, but one of them, it is the employee's partner with cancer. And so they're really struck. They're trying to figure out how best to work with this employee, be, specifically because of what Anna said, there's just a lot of stress and this employee is having a hard time kind of doing what needs to get done at work. So they're working with that and anything that any of, you know, you can come up with, um, you know, corporations, we could certainly talk because they're, they want to, they, they like this employee a lot, this one, and they want to keep this employee and they're really trying to work hard with this employee, but they don't have any resources to even refer this employee to. Um, so they're trying to set up some type of support so this employee can can really take care of their person and also, you know, do a, a little bit of work. Um, so it is it is something that, you know, affects, it, it's not just about the caregiver as well. It's also affecting, you know, we all know the cancer rates are really high between the ages of 35. I mean, they get high when you get older, between the ages of 35 and I think it's like 40 or 55, you know, 58% of the people get diagnosed with cancer. So those are working ages. So these we're talking about people who are showing up at work every day, trying to support employees, trying to do their job and support their spouse. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be quiet, I'm done with my plug. Thank you so much, Kim. So our Can next I add question. something? Oh, sure. Oh, Go ahead, Dr. Because Effie. one of the things that always bug me is why institutions don't allow, and it could be for cancer, it could be for other health issues, but to give employees and employees partners um, shared, I don't know what it's called because I'm, I'm not in the HR space, but, but shared um, like sick leave. So I would love to be able to donate my sick leave because I'm entitled to that, to a colleague um, or, you know, you know, someone who really needs it um, because I'm not using that time. So why don't they allow, and, and maybe, you know, there could be some limits or parameters around that, but it's not typically practice. And I think it, it doesn't make sense that, um, you know, people who are struggling, obviously people who need, um, you know, uh, sick leave uh, and paid time leave for, you know, caregiving, they need it because they, they, they have an urgent situation, right? Uh, um, and so 
I think it would be a wonderful thing to, you know, um, to, to activate our, our, our patients, our voters. I mean, you know, how do we get these things so that way sort of employee health and well-being are prioritized and, and, and employers are able to um, offer that because it, it would make a huge difference on the lives of so many people. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashin. So this question is related to our topic. Can you offer insights for cancer patients who have no caregiver or caretaker, so they are living alone with cancer? What are your organizations doing or recommending to assist? Most often it is simply a referral, but cancer patients may be overwhelmed with the follow-up, so referrals may be largely insufficient. That's a tough one because, um, you know, social isolation is a risk factor for all kinds of stuff, and especially for those who are ill or, or older or elderly. Um, and, you know, one of the things in partnership with, you know, City of Hope and um, Charles Drew University, we just actually completed a series of training on caregivers. So expanding that concept of sort of family and caregiving so that it can go beyond sort of blood relatives. And in, you know, many, you know, cultural, especially traditional and um, Aboriginal cultures, there's this notion of fictive kin, where you are bonded to people by relationship, not necessarily blood. And I think that could be an important um, component for cancer survivors, especially if they don't have family or you know, immigrants and they immigrated alone, so they don't have a network of care to um, expand that definition and to train more um, people like, like we did in partnership with, with Charles Drew, City of Hope and Charles Drew training a network, a cadre of navigators who are, you know, supportive care, but, but peer supportive care um, that can be available for those um, in the community. So, uh, you know, so support groups can serve that function, um, you know, because there are many who are isolated and, and that only intensifies the suffering. So yes, it's such an important question and I thought it was brilliant for bringing that up. Um, And if I can follow to Kimlin's point too, there are support groups. I also put into the chat Emmerman Angels, which is a resource that we share often in our community. And that's a, like a peer to peer mentorship. So you can actually get connected with somebody who has a cancer like you, or if you put other factors in that you're looking for, you're looking for somebody your same age into any kind of demographics. Um, and you can get partnered up with them to just either have a phone call or a video chat, but some, have some peer-to-peer -peer connection um, that can also supplement that, that isolation that you're feeling that maybe um, a support group doesn't really capture. You know, it, it's not the, the best fit. So that's just another resource I wanted to share. Just uh, honing in on the isolation piece, um, we're also uh, piloting a peer to peer mentorship program, which was supposed to be pre pandemic. And so, you know, we had this notion that people could get together over coffee during their infusion time in the waiting room, um, you know, with someone else who has a similar diagnosis um, or on a similar treatment. But with uh, COVID 19, we kept plugging along and uh, now we just completed our first um, uh, peer mentorship. Uh, training program. So we have um, several volunteers who um, are getting ready to get matched. So that's one of the ways that we're um, trying to, uh, you know, alleviate some of that isolation, which can happen, um, you know, even if you have a huge family and friends and support, the isolation can still be there because nobody really knows what you're going through, um, like somebody else, maybe with a similar diagnosis or um, treatment. So thank you everybody for sharing those wonderful resources. 
So we have time for one last question. This question is asking what impact, if any, does having supportive care services to refer to like cancer support community have on the well-being of the professional caregivers, like nurses, doctors, and other hospital staff? I know COVID really, uh, we really saw the need for services for our providers, right, who were suffering from a lot of these um, uh, mental health, you know, depression, anxiety, fear, just being overwhelmed. So if anybody would like to answer that. As a nurse practitioner, I can say I did jump in to help with the COVID-19 research uh, clinical trials that were starting, um, and I did that for six months, and it was six months too much, I felt. It was very traumatic. Um, I, there are no words. Uh, it took me six months to stop having nightmares. Um, but, you know, yeah, we did, we have anxiety, depression, yes, and such turnover in the healthcare field that, you know, we're still low on staff. Um, and that's just, I think, around the world. So, um, you know, what um, to have an organization like Cancer Support Community, you know, is just amazing, phenomenal, and you're in our backyard. <laughs> so <laughs> we're neighbors, it's wonderful um, to be able to have a go to that. And because everything has switched virtually, it's just the wide range of services that are offered. It's incredible to me. Keep up the good work. Would anybody else like to add to that? Well, I think something that we often forget is that nurses and doctors get cancer too. And, um, and, and their friends don't know what to do or what to say or how to help them either. So I just think it's it's one of those things we, we sort of, at least for me, I sort of kind of see them as immune and then you realize that they're not immune. And I think Anna, exactly what you said. So I, I, you know, I would love to see more support that I could refer, you know, um, um, you know my nurse friend to. Um, and so that they're not, and, and I think sometimes it has to be a little bit different um, than just being in a regular support group. Um, it has to be, you know, maybe it's medically, I, I don't know, but I just, I um, remember that very often that nurses and doctors get cancer too, and they're just as scared and they, and their friends don't know what to do either. And everyone's in that same and, you know, and there's also that piece where nurses and doctors want to help. They want to be able to support their, their patients and be able to say here, here's another resource for you. So I think again, what Anna said was, was really important and um, what you offer is amazing. You know, you because I can I can refer people to you and say this is a great organization. Go here. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. And and just to share, if I can speak for a, a minute for the, the on the behalf of the organization, it's just that we're right now in our strategic plan, uh, and we do those every three years. But we're regularly looking to see how we can grow and how we can. Um, expand our services, whether it be prevention, whether it be consultation, whether it be targeted groups like you're talking about, Kim, that we, maybe we think a bit, a, a bit differently about how we can be a support to providers. So I, I think all of this comes through feedback and conversation and dialogue. So I'm grateful to even hearing ideas like that and following up with them too. So I uh, want to say thank you for that. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank all of our roundtable participants for this wonderful discussion on how COVID has impacted our organizations and our communities and our work. Um, so we are going to move on to the rest of our agenda, but thank you so much to all our panelists. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Myra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.